everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of The Break It Down Show. Hey, today's episode features author, best-selling author, Samuel Katz, who has written a bunch of books with Fred Burton. Fred Burton, as you remember from earlier episodes, is a world-renowned expert on terrorism. And Sam, uh, though he's an author, has become the same thing. He writes books like The Beirut Rules, talking about the death of uh, William F. Buckley, and his latest book, No Shadows in the Desert, what he does is he examines the inner workings of ISIS in this case, but he looks at a lot of Middle Eastern problems. He's got a heart full of love for the country of Jordan and how they do things. We just have this long uh, talk about terrorism, about conflict, about how he sees things as an insider who gets the chance to look at things dispassionately and say, here, here are how these things go and here's how we counter them and here's where we make mistakes. I think it's fascinating talking about this topic and talking about terrorism in general as we try to understand our role in the world and how we can possibly stabilize and improve the condition of folks in the Middle East in terms of, and these things are always multi, multifaceted and, and, and stacked layer upon layer. So this is just one one layer of it, a very complex problem. But in terms of how we deal with terrorism, how we tamp down that effect, but also create the opportunity for the folks who are pushed to this point to come back to the middle and, and all work on a greater good in that country. Very complicated, very exciting stuff. And I think you'll dig what Sam has to offer. Samuel is, is a, a hell of a guy, and I can't wait to have him on again. I want to hear his book. I'm going to listen to it on Audible, uh, No Shadows in the Desert, because I'm desperate to now understand the inner workings of ISIS. as a guy that's chased guys like this around the Middle East. The more I know about this, the, the more fascinating it becomes. And, and all of their books, all of those, just go to Amazon, look up Fred Burton, look up Samuel Katz, and you will see what I'm talking about. These are fantastic books. If you're interested in this stuff at all, you're going to love it. Hey, I know you love the Break It Down show. And if you're new here, welcome. Thanks for coming and hanging out. We have all kinds of people, doctors, warriors, uh, scholars, historians, musicians, artists of all stripes. Sometimes we have friends. Sometimes we have family. We've had John's dad on the show. We've had Robert Greenberg on the show who talks about music at the highest level. And these are people that we all come to know and love. If you love those kind of conversations, that's what we do around here. All recorded on my Bulletproof podcast rig, a Zoom H6 and a Shure SM35 microphone. If you're into getting a podcast started, that's where I'd recommend you start first. That equipment will not fail you. You can take it anywhere you want and be mobile. Nothing's better than being mobile and portable. All right. One last thing. You know what I'm going to say. Save the brave. Save the brave.org. Go there. Click on the donate tab. Put a small amount of money in. And each month you will be helping us fight PTSD with veterans. All right. Thank you so much. Here comes Samuel M. Katz. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Samuel Katz. You're listening to The Break It Down Show. Yeah. Samuel Katz and I got hooked up because we had Fred Burton on. Fred Burton is a world-renowned counterterrorism expert, and Sam Katz has written a number of books with him, including Under Fire and, most recently, Beirut Rules. And I thought it would be fun to have you on to talk a little bit more about the, well, just, you know, the presence of terrorism in the world, because we often, I mean, I want to be fair to everybody. You know, we know terrorism is out there, and in the abstract, we know it's scary, but we, we start to divide on when we focus in on who is doing what. Obviously, most recently, General Soleimani was uh, killed by the Americans in Iraq. And some folks have a real problem with that. And other folks like me are like, hey, uh, that's a bad dude. And the less bad dudes around and the more that other bad dudes see bad dudes getting killed, um, the better chance we got to keep in control of this because they will continue to be predators looking for weaknesses and exploiting them and taking lives. So that's sort of like the premise overall is, is, is talk to someone like you that's written a lot of books about terror and get into that. And you also, I want to make sure we mention this. You guys can find Samuel at Samuel underscore M underscore cats on Twitter. He also has a Facebook page and I'll attach that into the notes. You can also go to Samuel cats online.com. If you want to learn about terrorism, you should get his books. There's more than a fistful of them there. And he also has a new one coming out. No shadows in the desert. We'll get to that in a little bit. Sam, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk about your partnership with Fred. Uh, you've written books on your own, and you've also written, written books with Fred. What what determines that for you? Why did you guys start working together? I've known Fred since he was a special agent in the diplomatic security service. And I was very, very fortunate um, at one point in my career to have learned of the diplomatic security service and what they do. And in many ways, it opened the world to me because the diplomatic security service operates on a global platform. And Fred was a very um, esteemed member of that service, Mm. um, considered one of their terrorism experts. And we became um, very close friends. And I learned that Fred had played an instrumental part in the capture of Ramzi Youssef that the State Department um, led in Pakistan in 1995, and that he ultimately risked his career to do the right thing and to put the pieces in play to apprehend um, Ramzi Youssef, who was the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993 and was working on an airline plot to kill close to 4,000 people um, in in one swoop in the Pacific. And we became friends, and then we wanted to do something about the diplomatic security service in the post-9-11 world, and then Benghazi happened. And then um, we thought that we would tell the story of the attack in Benghazi from the perspective of what it's like to be a member of the Foreign Service and the diplomatic security service in a treacherous location where... um, you know that there will be no backup and that if something goes bad, it's going to happen very quickly and it's going to be bloody. You said that Fred put his career on the line to capture a terrorist mastermind. Why is that the case? I'll let let Fred tell that story, but um, the State Department, when he was working there, um, an appointee in charge of the diplomatic or the Bureau of Diplomatic Security who had um, declared that terrorism was dead, Ramzi Youssef was known to be in Pakistan, and the local RSOs, the regional security officers stationed to the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, were hot on his trail. And every time they went through channels, they either um, their efforts were compromised, either in Washington or by the Pakistani government. Um, they always found themselves kicking down the door um, when the tea kettle was still hot. Mm. And it was frustrating. And a walk-in came in, into the embassy in Islamabad and said that he had details of this master plot and of Ramzi Yusuf. And Fred was working the counterterrorism desk. Um, I write about this in a book that I wrote in 2001 called Relentless Pursuit about how Ramzi Yusuf was apprehended. It was a blizzard in Washington. Fred was there, and he didn't, he didn't go up the chain of command seeking permission. Official Washington OK for the agents to um, to seize Ramsey Yusuf. They ultimately did, and as a result, one of the world's really dangerous people was apprehended, and a plot to um, assassinate President Clinton, assassinate the Pope, and to kill 4,000 um, innocent people never materialized. They're all, Washington is sometimes a hornet's nest of of backstabbing yes. um, <laughs> nonsense. There was there was great anger in Washington by the FBI, for example, that the State Department were the ones that picked up Ramsey Yusuf and not them. And there was a tug of war and a pissing match. Ultimately, um, as bureaucracies do, bureaucracies have a way of, um, if they would target someone, of numbing, numbing their and treating them very, very unfairly. And, and Instead of being praised as a hero, Fred was um, ostracized, and ultimately he left. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think that uh, you take someone as knowledgeable as Fred and you force him out because he was good at his job, uh, as opposed to you know, I don't know, you know, whatever the whatever the political world needs from from themselves and and their own advancement. I get that terrorism. Look. I, I've been in the rooms where we've been briefed on things that are ridiculous, you know, because there's always the folks that focus on threat are always focused on threat. 
and and uh, I've <laughs> I just re- received some really crazy briefings at times. So I understand like the the idea that hey, it's dead, but the reality is there's always someone plotting something to 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 create this terror, to create this splash, to create it. But it doesn't seem like to me, and, and what's your opinion on this, Sam? It doesn't seem like they're, they're good at the end game. You know, like it's one thing to, to kill 4,000 people in the Pacific all in one swoop, but, but to what end? Like, what, what do they intend to do? Well, there are many ways that you could look at that question. And the way that um, I think it should be looked at is that terror is a business. Forget the religious angle, forget the, forget the political element. Terror is a business that people choose to get into for one reason or another. And the more mayhem, the more bloodshed, um, usually the better off they are, either financially or in terms of power or in terms of, of many um, other little intricate uh, measures that make these people tick. Right. And we don't look at it as a business and we don't look at it um, in fighting terror as a business. But if you look at groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, or even ISIS, um, you know, it was, um, it was a, ISIS, for example, was a um, cash only sort of business um, that um, raped and pillaged um, for power. Um, There was no, um, and, and, and for making themselves wealthier and enjoying things that um, you know that they felt that they could use religion as the premise to recruit people to do their bidding. Mm. Um, if it was it, all these holy movements um, tend to forget the very pillars of the religion where murder is is forbidden, and and they use it for um, you know all sorts of um, despicable goals. You know, the heads of Hamas aren't living in, in, in the sewers of the Gaza Strip, you know, ready to fight the Israelis. They're flying around the Persian Gulf and Gulf Stream private jets and staying at the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. Um, their kids their kids get the best Western medical treatment. Sometimes they even get treatment in Israel. The the um, it, it's it's what they do. And I think if we look at it that way, it's an easier phenomenon to contain and possibly defeat. Mm. So uh, there, there can never there can never be an end game to killing four thousand people. Um, uh, you know, f- no cause justifies that. Right. Um, th- there's there's nothing there's there's nothing that could ever be said that um, uh, in the scriptures or in any definition of of any um, cause that will justify what happened on nine eleven right. or what justifies what justifies one man going into a um, bus in Israel and blowing himself up and killing women and children. Yeah. Yeah. None. I mean, there's, you just can't justify it. Are we, are we any better with the things that we do? I mean, flying robot planes into other countries and killing people, even if, if we actually get just the guy we want, we don't control the message there on the ground. Are, are we any better? Well, are we better? Are we terrorists? That's um, that's a philosophical question that I, I believe they um, they debate in Ivy League yeah. um, schools. So the answer that I would give would be this: um, if you target an individual who has blood on his hands or is um, working very hard so that his hands will be bloody, he is a legitimate target of a state. And it's um, and all the tools within a state. If you are um, targeting a um, a group of um, of shoppers in a sh- in a mall, or a bunch of people flying from Newark to the West Coast early one morning in September, and their only crime is that they are a target of opportunity, you know, then you are a terrorist. Um, the debate can go back and forth, but I think. I think those that are part of a nation state who take an oath and have rules of engagement um, can never be equated with people who um, who hope to get as high a body count as they can on the evening news. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think that's fair. You know, we have to ask some of these obvious questions because, 
you've got actual expertise and and I I agree with you. What if the nation state sponsors terror? Is the group and or the country that sponsors it a target? Like, so for example, and I'll just I'll say this: we know that Saudi Arabia sponsors terror. So, can we attack that state, or do we have to focus on the terror group uh, before it gets a little dicey? Well, now, now, now you're you're touching on um, a very difficult question of expediency and convenience versus morality. Right. The Saudis. Um, Maybe we'll never know, depending on the redex on the 9-11 reports, but um, the Saudi role in the 9-11 attacks um, has yet to be flushed out. Um, Saudi Arabia, in many ways, began sponsoring terrorism um, as a very convenient tool so that it wouldn't happen on their soil. Mm. They exported it rather than, than had it happened there. And Saudi investment in the madrasas of Pakistan um, and and what ultimately morphed into Al Qaeda is, is, is proof of that. A lot of states support terrorists, um, and a lot of states make deals with terrorists. It doesn't make it right. Mm-hmm. People people at the helm of power sometimes have to make incredibly difficult decisions, and more often than not, they make the wrong ones. How do you improve that? Uh, well, if if you guide um, national policy um, on a moral compass, um, you'll have very few friends because a lot of your friends <laughs> are really nasty people. Right. And a lot of those nasty people happen to have resources that you need so that you can have a very large screen um, telephone and so you can stream um, nonsense and, and, and watch videos that go viral. It, you know, I, I think... Uh, we're we're so over inundated with the challenges of day to day life mm-hmm. that the morality um, element sometimes gets overlooked, but in many ways it shouldn't, and we shouldn't exchange our creature comforts for what's right and wrong, and we shouldn't reward nations um, that have invested heavily in those who have killed us and reward them. What do you do when, so I, I recall when, when President Bush the Younger, when he made his speech, basically laying out the Bush doctrine and saying that we're going to go after terror and be proactive instead of our, our formerly reactive approach. But we all knew at the time he wasn't going to go attack Ireland, but Ireland's our friends, you know, they've got an internal struggle that sometimes crept out, you know, outside of their immediate borders, but when is terrorism not worthy of a nation state like the U.S.'s attention? I mean, we put a lot of attention on it from a diplomatic point of view, but we we really didn't do a lot of openly overt, uh, you know, attention on them. It's just a hard thing to do. And then you got the you know you can go to Burma, Burma or Myanmar, depending on what state they're in right now, because they are conflicted and there's terror there and there's. You know, there's religious terrorism. There's a lot of different things that we choose to not get involved in. H- how do we sort this out better? We sort this out usually. The United States sorts it out usually um, as to what's good for business. You know, what's good for the um, Department of Treasury. What's good for money. Right. Um, you know, why why are we so concerned with nations in the Middle East? Where um, or why do we overlook certain nations in the Middle East that don't have oil? Um, you know, how do we allow two million people to be butchered in Rwanda when and, and we um, intervene when um, members of the Kuwaiti royal family are forced to flee? Um, you know, there, there are lots of questions and I'm, I'm simplifying it. So yeah. um, I, I, apo- I apologize. But we pick and choose where we want to fight. And we usually pick and choose where we want to fight based on um, where we can win. Mm. And what's the what's the plus plus for our side? Um, I thought that President Bush, using the term axis of evil, um, really mischaracterized who we were up against. When you use the word evil, it becomes very comic bookish. And um, the stakes are incredibly high. And a lot of brave people have, have had to sacrifice their lives fighting enemies and to, and to label them something as simplistic as evil. Um, only guarantees 
that you know we'll be in a position where um, we possibly make mistakes moving forward and commit um, forces on causes that might um, not pass the muster that they should, like the like you know, the war in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you about the war in Iraq. So as we're getting further from the initial part of it and everything, it's looking more and more like a complete disaster. Um, did Was there a better move at the time? Uh, according, depending on who um, who you listen to, which intelligence briefing yeah. is read by and by who and what slant is placed on it. Um, you know, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And um, which... The United States, after 9-11, had the opportunity, in my opinion, along with um, nations of, of the West, and even even other nations like um, Russia at the time, or those kind of in the middle, to say, listen, you know, we've all we've all played this game. Um, the stakes, um, because of technology and imagination, have become really, really high. You know, this stops today. Yeah. And, and and you know there could have been an effort to go after to put all the political and financial concerns aside and said we're going to go after after X Y and Z and that would have put some of our allies like the Saudis and the Pakistanis um, on notice. Clearly, nine eleven would never have been able to have happened without Pakistan and the um, ISI um, helping to bolster Al Qaeda yeah. and protecting it. As, as we saw where um, bin Laden um, was was hiding. But instead, this country chose to focus on an old nemesis. And, and, and doing whatever it could to shift the focus. And weapons of mass destruction um, terrified people because um, we did have an attack that in one day killed almost 3,000 people. Yeah. And... The fear was what would happen if one of these um, players you know, had the ability to kill 300,000. But sometimes in dismantling something, you create something far worse than, um, you know, than what it was before. And Saddam was really a bad egg, and the country was really messed up, and the Iraqi people were terrorized. But there were rules and regulations, and there were... Uh, there were means that this country took for years to contain um, Saddam Hussein. And sometimes when, uh, when something so hated like his rule disappears and people who, who aren't really expert in the nuances of that nation then take over, you know, all sorts of craziness could happen. Um, it, it's been, I'm not the first one to point out that the decision to disband the, um, Iraqi civil service um, and rid the army and the um, unions and, and everything else of the people that made the country tick of any um, Saddam Hussein loyalists ultimately was the factor that led to um, the creation of ISIS and helped lead to the creation of Al Qaeda in Iraq before that and resulted in so much misery and so many deaths on our side. And in Iraq, looking at the past lessons of history, well, that nation building in the Middle East is better, is better you know, something that you avoid. Um, and it had people looked at what happens um, in, in uh, countries that are liberated and how um, government and self-government is, is, is handled, even looking at examples from the post-war um, period from the Second World War, we could have avoided so many stupid mistakes that ultimately embroiled us for years in a quagmire. And in a quagmire that um, because of ISIS, we, we couldn't really pull out of. And now that we've sort of left the Middle East um, under the current administration, our ability to alter um, events um, to our benefit and to the benefit of others and most importantly, our allies is severely restricted. Uh, yeah, those mistakes seem to compound on where we could have been versus where we are now. Is uh, you know, now we have no appetite to do anything. You know, like the president is. First off, you know, from talking to a lot of different people, our foreign policy president 
presidential I don't know, capabilities has been pretty wanting for a long time. We don't have a uh, we have a giant budget for the military, but if we're really going to give diplomacy a chance to stabilize these regions and get really bright people out there to help solve some of these problems, we, you know, there, there's I don't know. Peter Van Buren was saying there's about five thousand people in the State Department if you include contractors and everything else, and maybe the number's a little bigger, maybe it's a little smaller, but that's a brigade, a brigade, you know. <laughs> Like you could do, you could double the size of the state department, get rid of a, a brigade. And I'm not trying to make cuts to the military, but you could do a lot more help. Cause when I was in Afghanistan, the state department folks that were there, they were basically pinned to their desk, their office. And then when they went out, they went across the street. They didn't go out into the, uh, to the province as a whole. They just stayed in their office for the most part. How on earth can you, how on earth can you, you know, derail terror and suffering and all the things that cause the negative things if, if you can't get out of your office. Well, Jean Le Carre um, so correctly said that it's very dangerous to um, look at the world from behind the desk. <laughs> and um, But in many cases, um, the, the dangers that diplomats face are so great. And the desire for the greater whole, the State Department at Foggy Bottom, to take risks um, um, are so small. I mean, look at what happens politically after Benghazi. Yeah. That um, that decisions are made from behind the desk or on um, on Skype. It, it limits us. Um, in the United States, we have a very um, unique vision of the world, and that vision isn't correct in many cases. And Every four years, that vision also can change, and it could change drastically and dramatically. So there is no continuance. There is no um, there is no stability in terms of what we um, we can offer on soft and hard power. And of course, many people around the world, what they um, um, the United States is very very good at throwing money at problems. When um, sometimes um, some really harsh decisions need to be made, and sometimes um, some very brave and politically incorrect decisions need to be made. I don't see either party um, um, being able to articulate um, what must happen or what should happen. Um, there are always extremes or always benign negligence that, that happens. Um, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous and it's going to continue to be dangerous. Let's talk a little bit about Beirut rules and what you and Fred wrote about so we can sort of dive into that. And and again, I I can't stress this enough for everybody listening. Your guys' books are excellent and, and you really tackle some, some challenging stories that are fascinating. And, and I just, I thank you for writing those books, but let's talk about Beirut rules for a little bit. Beirut rules is a sad story. Uh, it's a tragic story of William S. Buckley, um, not the TV um, common commentator, but um, a, um, a special forces um, colonel, a um, Silver Star recipient, and a man who worked for the CIA and volunteered to head to Lebanon in 1984 to serve as chief of station. Um, he was the wrong man to be sent. Um, he was a paramilitary officer. Um, and the U.S. intelligence community in, in Lebanon had been eviscerated by the suicide truck bombing of the U.S. embassy um, when the intelligence community was having a lunch meeting in 1983. And Buckley was sent there to rebuild capabilities, but he wasn't the clandestine um, expert. Mm. And he played by the old rules that um, certain people were were off limits in the war that spies um, carried out. And chiefs of station were not targeted. Chiefs of station were off limits. Um, Those were the old rules of the Cold War, but in Beirut rules, where Hezbollah and Iran was um, were were staking their claim to a new Middle East, um, there were no rules. Bill Buckley was was kidnapped as he um, left his home one one morning in March of 1984, never to be seen again. The catastrophic reality of a chief of station being seized by a hostile force 
one that was subservient to an enemy of ours, um, is, is still to this day unfathomable in the um, in the intelligence community. Um, what he was able ultimately to disclose through torture harmed U.S. capabilities in the region for a long time. And what also harmed our capabilities in terms of um, deterrence was that there was no calamity plan at CIA. You know, what happens if? And efforts to bring him home were almost non-existent. Um, there were special forces um, attempts to gather intelligence. There were friends of his that went looking for him, but there was no coordinated hardball effort that that told the kidnappers, you know, he, you know, he's 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 going to be at a bus station in Beirut the next morning. Otherwise, X, Y, and Z are going to find their throat slit. We didn't play by those rules, and it's almost it could be said that up until the Soleimani hit, we didn't play by those rules, um, for better or for worse, and. Iran's war with the United States in the Middle East, particularly in Lebanon, um, is tragic because we allowed Hezbollah to grow and to become one of the most powerful conventional militaries in the world. Mm. And if there will be retribution for Soleimani, the Iranians by nature use proxies and their proxy of choice is Hezbollah. And up until 9-11, Hezbollah was responsible for the deaths of more Americans than any other terrorist group out there. So you just said a mouthful, that whole, that last bit, but also the whole, our approach to, hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You just said a mouthful, that whole, that last bit, but also the whole, our approach to, you know, chiefs of station and, and playing by the old rules. How, how often are the rules rewritten? I mean, you know, we're, we're a leader in so many ways, but the small nimble organizations, they get to change the rules faster than we can adapt. So is it, they don't have to play by rules. Aha. Okay. Please go on. Um, the terrorists don't play by rules. They um, they write it as they go along. If um, if the Quds Force and the Hezbollah chief decide that they're going to um, torture um, this uh, middle-aged man and make a laughing stock of Langley, um, they'll do it. If they want to um, hang a U.S. Marine colonel who was working as a peacekeeper in southern Lebanon, they'll do it. And they'll hold the bodies at ransom, as they did with both William Buckley and Colonel William Higgins, um, the Marine colonel who I just mentioned, who was um, murdered, who was kidnapped in um, 1988. His body was, um, Hezbollah released a gruesome video of him hanging you know, from, from the rafters at, um, a year later. Um, cruelty is part of, of the fear factor that goes into terrorism. And we have congressional oversight and we have morality. And there are certain things that up until a certain point we didn't do. 9-11 in many ways changed that. As you, as you said before, we have the killer robots flying in the skies um, all over the world. Right. Um, and in many ways, that's, that's a good thing because you don't have to risk human assets to, um, to take out individuals. The only bad thing about that is sometimes there's collateral damage where innocent people are killed. And if you rely too heavily on, um, on the killer robots, on the, um, you know, on the Reapers flying around with their Hellfire missiles, you don't have the ability to use your high-value targets for any intelligence benefit. Um, the Israelis have a saying, uh, we'd rather snatch you than scratch you. Right. Um, when, when you're sitting in a room um, and ultimately talking, you provide much, you're of a greater benefit than sometimes when you're, when you're dead. Um, and you hold a much, um, a 
higher um, purpose as as a target. But there are many bad players out there, and sometimes the people at the top are so confused by who's currently on our side and who's not that um, we sometimes have groups like we had in, in Syria, groups that the DIA is funding, fighting groups that the CIA was funding. <laughs> Let me break that down real quick for the audience. So we try to pick people who can create a desired outcome for us, whether it's the CIA or the DIA, uh, these different three-letter agencies, they go out and they fund things. And quite often, these are like my line of work, right? I'm a spy. I'm out. I'm talking to the worst people I can find. The CIA is in the same business. Delta Force is in the same business. So if we go out and we collect, we find these bad people and we put them on the payroll and <laughs> they don't stop being bad. We're just hoping that they're, you know, bad in a way that benefits us. So meanwhile, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, th those guys are collecting and doing things. And they're like, hey, look at this bad group over here doing all these bad things. And so they'll kind of cross streams. And it's sort of like, uh, and Brad will appreciate this, it's uh, sort of like Berlinery all over again where you have, you know, we're all trying to undermine the enemy. And while we do that, we find we end up collecting that 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 we're also being attacked in new and, and creative ways and often very often funded by us. It doesn't take a sharp eye to look at ISIS soldiers from the, from their their peak and see the U.S. training as those guys were shooting people in the head. Very, very often that, that we have this uh, unfortunate blowback of, of crossing crossing streams and having our own efforts to win, come back and attack us. So I had to put that out there, Sam, so people can understand kind of the what you just said because it's so interesting and how complex, you know, the brilliant idea is but the execution of the idea is often significantly harder than we ever realized i think that this country in particular um and again it's it's not a it's not a um a, an indictment but because the resources are so vast there's a fondness for throwing vast sums of um, huge sums of money containers full of cash at problems yes often in especially in the middle east where there's a tribal mentality. Um, the cash isn't as important as other things. Um, honor, um, bloodlines. Um, and we find it, I think, uh, as a rule, difficult to understand that mentality. And I don't think that we, we have mastered it correctly yet. And I think it, uh, it inhibits us. And it also um, disables us from sometimes making decisions based on what's right rather than um, what we got to bargain for. Yeah. And you only have to look at um, our very sad um, relationship with the Kurds as an example of that. As, you know, there, there are 30 something million Kurds in the Middle East. They're the largest ethnic group without a state of their own. They, um, you know, they are secular. They are courageous, and even though they have their own stubborn um, disabilities, such as they don't talk to one another in, in different countries, these are allies that have fought and died with us and for us. And um, I think what happened with the Kurds is personifies in some cases, many of the miscues that we continue to make in the Middle East. Yeah, the Kurd conversation is really complex, you know, and I'm working on getting some very high-level Kurds to come on the show. But as you can imagine, they don't trust anybody, including themselves, so it's really hard to get them to come on. But just to do a real quick, fast primer for everybody listening, the Kurds have several factions. They can all be violent, extremely violent, and in terrible directions, um, internally included. So... They don't agree with, with themselves, and then we have this great relationship with them, but our relationship is always going to be based on betrayal because, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, no president is going to circle the map and say, that's Kurdistan, and I'll be damned if it's not, because that would mean you would take a part of Iran, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and, and maybe even a little bit of Jordan on some maps, but you take this this big swath out of these other countries and say that's now their place. That's never going to happen, at least not anytime soon. 
And so there's always betrayal coming. And yet, you know, the Kurds, if any, if any people on the planet that are in a group but do not have a country, they are the biggest. And they have done the most to say, we, we have done what we're supposed to do. We have fought, you know, the oppressor. We continue to stand and, and establish ourselves. But, but they just can't seem to get over the hump internationally. So Kurdistan is a very, very, very tricky place. And we're going to continue to train them and yet never fully commit to them. And, and it's one of those things that's damning. I, I guess my question to you, Sam, is any thoughts on that? And is there a president and should there be someone that says that's Kurdistan? Well, going back to what we discussed earlier about um, someone in the foreign policy realm making a very courageous it's not a politically incorrect decision. Um, the Kurds are, um, are are well in place in Iran, in Iraq, in Turkey, and in Syria. Right. Kurds in Iraq, in the what's known as the Kurdish um, Kurdish regional government, are the ones that are the are the only ones that have a true truly autonomous region. I visited there in in, in June. And um, I, 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 w- I was with the Peshmerga, and I listened to what they had to say. Um, and the Kurds are great people, the friendliest people on the planet. They're also incredibly stubborn. Yes. And the Kurds in Iraq don't, don't like talking to the Kurds in Syria. And the Kurds in Iraq don't like talking to the Kurds in Turkey. And the ones in Iran don't like talking to the ones in, in Turkey. And there is no, and even the ones in Iraq have um, different parties. And, um, you know, Kurdistan is almost divided into two different regions, depending on political um, allegiance. The Middle East is, is, is a fragile house of cards. And when we sort of yank um, a group of cards, um, our interests um, tumble and they collapse. And having Turkey, which is, although a member of NATO, is proving to be almost a rogue state trying to reinstate the, um, the old days of the Ottoman power, uh, Ottoman um, empire where, where they have a true say in what goes on in the region and letting um, Russia in is a defeat for us because ultimately we're going to have to go back and correct mistakes. Yeah. And those corrections will um, cost um, innocent lives and um, on the ground there, of the local residents, and they're going to cost the lives of brave men and women who, um, who, who, who serve on our behalf. Yeah, no, that's a good wrap up. And if we can't even get, <laughs> talk about the Kurds can't get along, we can't even get bipartisan legislation reliably passed through the House. So, uh, so us getting things right is going to be really, it's going to be really challenging. So if if you if you look at that quickly, um, yeah. when we're weak, when we're weakened, and our allies in the Middle East are weakened, we allow others to um, to fill the void and fill the vacuum. And what we've done is create a golden opportunity for Russia to reclaim status in the Middle East that it had during the Cold War and that it lost when the old Soviet Union disappeared. And um, we were lucky in the Cold War that most of the, the Soviet slash Russian retreat happened without us having to fire a shot in anger. But we may not be so lucky the next time. Right. And we're only opening ourselves up for further conflict and further bloodshed. And um, it would have been so much better had saner heads, more pragmatic people um, at the top who weren't tribal, um, work together and to chart a course for how this country will um, have to deal in the Middle East tomorrow and you know, 30 years worth of tomorrows in the future. Is it, is it actually possible to get this stuff right? Or is that just like a hope and like, we would be great if this happened, but reality is it ain't happening. Well, to get it right, you need boots on the ground. People who understand who understand the region and who share your common core values. Uh Um, And so in the book that I have coming out in April, No Shadows in the Desert, it deals with uh, the Jordanian Intelligence Service, the GID, and how they went after the ISIS leadership that um, captured a Jordanian F-16 pilot and burned him alive. Uh 
Mm. The important thing there was in the war against ISIS, um, the Jordanians served really as our human capability on the ground because we lack an intimacy on, um, in the tribal areas and inside the towns and villages and cities that, um, that we, we require. Um, we, can't, we can't win intelligence wars they solely on cell phone intercepts and emails that, that we can pluck out of thin air. It's running agents. It's understanding the cultural cues. And we cannot do that well um, because we don't live there. And even if you have an intelligence officer who speaks fluent Arabic, um, he'll be in a post for two or three years, maybe four, and he'll leave. Yeah. And what's left is, is, you know, for the next guy. And the next guy might not be so good. The next guy might have um, completely different skill sets. Yeah. So we need alliances and we need nations that we can rely upon and who can rely upon us and, and, to, um, and to share the workload together. The other thing that's interesting, too, is, is uh, when I was working as a spy, I got to stay at the ground level the whole time. Uh, and I got better and better. And like you would imagine, you know, you do that for 10, 15, 20 years, you know, you're going to get better, but organizations like state department or whoever it's going to be, even the military, you graduate up so that you're further and further removed from the ground. So that field knowledge that you have is, uh, I don't want to say it's a relic because that's not exactly accurate, but you, you crave ground truth and you just can't get it and you don't have it yourself, even though if you had the ability to, you might be all right at it, you know, and, and go out and go get it. But you're you're in a staff room again. You're behind that desk, you know. The the field officers, the intelligence officers, who want that ground truth, um, often do so at great risk. Right. And and the people who get promoted up, you know, the higher you go up the food chain, the more money you make, the better life is, the more perks you get, the less likely you are to take political risks. Right. And that's in and that's in every large bureaucracy, and that's one of the failings of it, is that individuals won't stake their careers on what's right or what might um, be the best thing. They'll do what's safe. Sometimes doing the safe thing is the most dangerous thing anyone can do. <laughs> you just said a mouthful there. I mean, really, you just yeah, you can put a lot of people at jeopardy by uh, by doing the safe thing. Uh, let's. Do you want to talk about your new book that's coming out, or do you want to spend some more time on Beirut rules? Up to you. Um, the new book will be out on April 21st. It's the first ever published um, look at the inner workings of an Arab intelligence service. And it, the campaign that the Jordanians um, led, um, along with the CIA and, and coalition forces, to make those who took the decision to burn this young pilot alive. That campaign ultimately helped remove some of the uh, most capable commanders in ISIS and helped um, expedite you know, the terror group's downfall. How did you come across this story? I've been working, uh, um, doing work in Jordan for many, many years, working with their special forces. And I always liked... Um, to write about groups and entities that had to work twice as hard for half the credit. Mm. The Jordanians um, are very good at what they do, and they um, they find themselves in a really difficult um, location of real estate, bordered by the Arab-Israeli dispute, um, Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. And the way that the, the Jordanians have survived this um, misfortune of um, location is by um, getting, having the ability to work with everybody mm. and to know everybody. As a result, their intelligence service um, is, is incredibly capable, but it's one that doesn't have the resources of the CIA um, or some of the other Western groups. And it's permission to sit at the high table, as John Le Carre once said, of some of the larger um, espionage organizations, comes as a result of the abilities of its human of its human intelligence, of its agents in the field. Yeah. And I thought that this was um, an incredibly um, important story 
and also one that gives insight into how the Middle East functions. And unless we have an understanding of that functioning, um, we'll be, we'll, the West will be destined to repeat those mistakes over and over and over again. <sighs> yes. <laughs> like, like we continue to do. Um, when you're digging through all this stuff, what about Jordan sticks out to you? Like you seem to be drawn there. What is it about that, that people, that place? It's a no man's land. It's um, a buffer. Mm. It's a buffer for, um, it's, um, it, it's pro Western pro American. Um, yet it's trapped in an ancient land with very, um, ancient practices and, um, tribal traditions. Um, you know, here you have, the best of and sometimes worst of many worlds, um, you know, colliding. Um, you know, it's a unique nation that is one of the two Arab signatories of peace with Israel. And it's, it identifies in many ways with the West, but it lives in the Middle East and it has to adapt and it has to, um, to function among many neighbors who are are less than the, uh, who, are, who are less than honorable in, in their intentions yeah. and often um, you know want to destabilize um, the kingdom and, um, and and turn it into a battlefield yeah Jordan's right there right they're right in the middle of everything and not all of their neighbors are, are good actors yeah do you think will we see the the greater Levant that whole region um, the Orient in general, will it calm down? Will we just get to a point where there's so much ubiquitousness with uh, information and, you know, trade that, that we just get past the point where, where there's just so much conflict there? One of the, um, one of the fringe benefits of um, the Shiite, Shiite crescent, Iran's efforts to spread itself from Afghanistan to Lebanon is that it really put the Sunni nations on notice. And um, one of the French benefits of that is that covert ties between the Sunni nations and Israel have gone from a kind of hush-hush to a lot more in your face. If other nations in the Middle East can um, sign peace with Israel, and the Palestinian question can be solved properly, then you take away the argument of many of the radicals in the region. And there have always been certain, um, certain uh, whistles that have been used to um, turn what could be a peaceful Middle East into one of bloodshed, and the um, Arab-Israeli dispute has been won. And I think if you remove that somehow, and um, you enable um, a fairly unique combination of nations, some with resources, some with um, like oil and, and others, and others with technology like Israel. That could be a formidable block. At, at the end of the day, uh, people want to, of, of these countries, want to have peaceful lives where their children are better off than themselves. They all want to basically live the American dream. Yeah. It's just circumstances beyond their control and, and often dictated by terrorists who, who use those stomping grounds um, for their own good that prevent that from happening and create much of the tumult that we have in the world and have had for the last 40, 50 years. Yeah. No, it, it's a great point. And, and that, like you said, uh, the thing I found is that people do, they, they don't like cancer. They want their kids to do well. You know, these are common human themes. And one of the things that I found that undermines success is just a lot, a lot of folks in the Mideast, the, the Orient, whatever you want to call that region, they don't believe that there is something better. They, they want it. They would like to have it. But as soon as anybody gets anything better, they look at it and and they're just like it's never going to happen to me. They get all the advantage, and then just creates this grinding instability that is just it's just damn impossible to uh, to relieve that pressure and and to get folks to believe. So I feel like some kind of external technological 
change will continue to improve their position to where electricity, for example, could be ubiquitous. You could put a battery in your damn house. You know, <laughs> it's like, I don't need anybody else. I've got my own power. You know, my fan will be on all day. I can have an air conditioner now. It's just something like that is going to start to chill that region out and and give them a chance to actually believe in a better future and just reliably chase it because it's just, it's so unreliable well, for so many of them. There has been for many years this sense of um, hopeless resignation. Yeah. That um, this is the Middle East. Um, what do you expect? Right. But technology, technology changes that. And um, I mean, if if you are in the Persian Gulf and you are navigating, you're using waves. And if you're using waves, you're using an Israeli application. Right. There could be a boycott against products from Israel, but lo and behold, you've downloaded it on your phone. Um, it's harder and harder for governments to suppress information um, in the region. And the more people know, the more they want to know. And I can, one can only hope that uh, the situation for all involved, including ourselves, um, will improve um, somehow and that saner minds will take their home. But until then, you know, you hold your breath when you put the news on and see what's, you know, happening next. Well, I, I, I love this chat that we're having. And yeah, I mean, you're a guy that's been out there. You know what it's like. You've seen these things. You understand the terrorism aspect of it. And it's just great to be able to have these kind of, look, we didn't hardly talk about politics at all, but yet we talked about politics the entire hour, you know, policy and, and rules and everything else. So it's just good to have a sane conversation with folks that are like, that can paint paint the picture well. And I really appreciate you for doing it. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate you calling me sane. You might be one of the first um, to do so. <laughs> Everybody, this is Samuel Katz. You can get his work at samuelkatzonline.com. Of course, as always, encourage you to go to Amazon, and anytime you buy a book, rate and review it. Those five stars in that review, even if it's a simple review, that alerts the computer and lets it know, hey, someone bought this book and they took the time to do that. It's how you help people like Samuel out so that they can sell more books. They get bumped up. They get recommended more. That is how you help. So buy the book. And if you're really curious about terrorism, I, I can't recommend any higher the, the books that Samuel and, and Fred have written together. I mean, you, you'll get into it and you'll be amazed at, at the stories. So. Thanks again for coming on, Samuel. And and uh, let's do when you're, the book comes out. Let's uh, let's do another one. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me on.